there are a lot of activities that help you create Slack, but Slack also helps you create a lot of activities and it gets into this feedback loop. So for instance, we spoke about things like investing or honesty. All of those kind of things give you the ability to create Slack in the future. But Slack gives you the ability to do those things. And that feedback loop is very important. Welcome back to Bit of a Tangent. I'm Jared. And as always, joining me today is Jean-Luc. We've got a great episode for you today, folks. Today, we're discussing the little known but unbelievably important concept of Slack what it is, why having too little of it can be deadly, and how to get more of it. We also discuss the difference between attention and awareness and how knowing this can help you live a more engaged life. We discuss a simple rule of thumb to help you know when you're using your time on Earth well, and a quick trick to help you train your mind to dive straight into deep focus when you need to. Lastly, we discuss how we've set up our own personal devices to get the most out of them while minimizing distractions. And as a bonus in this episode, we actually mentioned two other podcasts that we're both loving at the moment. This one was really, really interesting, and I definitely walked away with a bunch of new ideas from it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And if you do, let us know by rating and reviewing us on iTunes or wherever you happen to listen to it. So without further ado... Here's episode 11 of Bit of a Tangent. So I think the main topic that we're going to be diving into tonight is going to be this idea of Slack. And when I messaged you to uh, broach the topic, the reason was because this is something which I've seen spoken about in this sort of rationalist sub-community on the Less Wrong forums. But for all the talk of mental models in other places, uh, for example, Shane Parrish's blog, Farnham Street, and I think a lot of podcasts have been coming out recently, it doesn't come up as much, right? So it doesn't come up in the same way that, you know, base rate neglect comes up or, geez, am I, is that my only example of a bias? <laughs> it doesn't come up in the same way, though, as, you know, confirmation bias, right? Or planning fallacy. The planning or... fallacy, confirmation bias, etc. And that might be interesting to talk about in its own, but the topic and the idea itself is really interesting. And I think you can see a lot of it come out when you start to think of why people fall into these two groups. And the two groups are the people who seem to be doing what they want to be doing and the people who look at those people and then say, oh, I would love to do that if only I had the time, right? And it was hearing that kind of comment a few times, actually, uh, talking to friends in medical school, when I started to think about this more and tie it back into this idea of Slack. So how about we get that definition out of the way and then we can dive in? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I don't know if you if you have something that you sort of refer to in specific when you're talking about Slack. I mean, suffice to say, we're not talking about the popular messaging service used by many companies throughout the, the world but uh, <laughs> that is that is that is quite a, a useful tool but not the slack we're referring to no no so when i think about slack i think about that word in the sense of leeway right the ability to have some sort of buffer before you are redlining it the analogy i think of is a car uh, a car engine and you are either running and you have plenty of ceiling to run into, right? You can rev higher or you are running right in the red zone and you're hitting the limits, right? The sort of formal definition, at least by a poster on less wrong named Zvi, Z-V-I, defined Slack as just the absence of binding constraints on your behavior. And I think that's a good formalism to have, but I like the analogy of the, the car redlining because I think it captures quite intuitively what can go wrong and why this idea is, is so key. And if I'm going to go into that, 
what I would say is having Slack, right, is just this ability not to be always pushed up against your limits, right? And limits here, I mean, this could be any constraint. This could be time or money or attention. Um, those, I think those three tend to be the fundamental ones, but, you know, you could find others. And the reason that becomes important is because when you are running up against that limit, any slight delta of extra uh, constraint, or you know, rather any slight delta of added necessity, right, or added burden, right? So any added delta of some burden will push you over the edge, right? You don't have the laxity or the to almost respond dynamically. And so if I'm going to uh, look at the original post here, I think uh, this poster as V puts it quite well, where he says, Slack means margin for error. You can relax. Slack allows pursuing opportunities. You can explore. You can trade. Slack prevents desperation. You can avoid bad trades and wait for better spots. Slack permits planning for the long term. You can invest. Slack enables doing things for your own amusement. You can play games. You can have fun. Slack enables you doing the right thing. Stand by your friends. Reward the worthy. Punish the wicked. You can have a code. Slack presents things as they are without concern for how things look or what others think. You can be honest. You can do some of these things and you can choose not to do others because you don't have to. So I think that sort of very pithy set of statements there captures some of these key intuitions of why this property is so important. And it is, it's that optionality, right? So I don't know if you want to uh, respond to that there, but... Yeah, I mean, I think my sort of takeaway of, of that, and I, I remember that post well from, I think, maybe more than a year ago now that I first read it, I think when it actually came out, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. But the key takeaway is sort of that Slack is freedom, right? It means that you are able to respond to changes in your environment or in your internal state without sacrificing things in your life right so a great example there was you can you can have a code and we've spoken before about our policy of of not lying based very much on sam harris and his book lying and how that imposes some acute burden but in the long term you benefit by not lying right so so an honest life is beneficial in the long run in totality all things considered but sometimes in the short term it feels like lying is the better option but when you have slack you're never in that situation because you have the freedom and the breathing room to absorb some of the acute the short-term difficulty that something like telling the honest truth might involve in order to gain the long-term effects mm. and it's it's almost exactly analogous to investing in that sense right if you have upfront capital you've got fr flexibility and freedom you can choose where to put that where to invest it so that in the long term you can have greater rewards whereas if you're living paycheck to paycheck you've got no slack and you are always going to be just what comes in goes out yeah so i think the reason this is so interesting is because a lot of those things i don't think before it's been pointed out so nicely here would have been linked to this concept. So people would just say, well, have the principle of don't lie or, you know, you should invest. But I think, I think first of all, this has been written about quite well in other places, um, but there are like good economic reasons why it's really difficult. For example, if you were already quite poor to, you know, follow the advice of uh, rich people who talk about investing or saving for the future, right? Um, I mean, you can just conceptualize this. If you are earning some amount of money, let's say you're earning 5,000 rand a month and your expenses were 5,000 rand a month, well, suddenly a doctor's appointment or a taxi to get somewhere, first of all, you, you either can't afford that or having to afford that, let's say it's a necessary expense, means you have to sacrifice something else. So as you say, right, you don't get the chance to save for another day. You have no slack and... This sort of leads on to, I think, where this conversation is going, which is on the, this idea of defending Slack. 
and and valuing it because i think we're living in an age and especially in a generation where i think we are habitually filling up our time mm. right so whether that's the influence of social media or just the next netflix special you're going to watch we do a good job of filling our time and so i think that's one way we eat into our slack and it's interesting to think about the ways in which our slack is attacked right by companies who sort of can algorithmically shape our choices and how much we choose to engage with a certain product right so i think the direction that it'd be interesting to take is this so now i think that we've got the importance of slack maybe intuitively laid out the road to go down for me at least is this idea of fighting for it and preventing sort of an onslaught that is just the default expansion of other things into your time and your mental freedom if i can say it that way yeah absolutely so i think the first key thing that really stood out there is you mentioned how in the modern world it's it seems to be that everything is demanding of our time and that we are very good at filling our time and a large part of that is the influence of things like social media and generally the attention economy right if our attention and therefore our time has inherent value because it can be sold to advertisers, then there are huge companies out there who are going to use all their resources to try and consume that time. And we know from the personal experience of being a human that it is very hard to defend time when there are so many things that are, it's not a symmetric problem, let's put it that way, right? So something taking up your time is much easier than you preventing something from taking up your time. It doesn't go 50%, 50%. It doesn't, it's not a coin toss. It's very much the flow is, is one directional and it takes a huge effort to actually remove things, right? It's very easy to add. And especially when you talk about all these social media services, like once you've got Facebook, well, now there's Instagram. And once you've got those, then, well, there's Twitter and there's always something more. And then, oh, we, you know, for your career stuff, then you have to have LinkedIn. And if you're a programmer and well, you've got GitHub, uh, and you've got to fill that up with a whole bunch of stuff. So, I mean, it, it's so easy for all these services to actually, you know, lure you in with some value, but ultimately be sapping a large portion of your time. And I feel like I've just dragged GitHub through the mud there with Facebook and Instagram and even LinkedIn to some extent. Um, but uh, yeah, that seems a bit unfair, but hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what I mean is that there are a lot of things out there that aren't useful to everybody and a lot of things out there that aren't really useful at all. And yet they all thrive on the ability to make themselves seem indispensable and therefore take up much more time and uh, importance in your life. So that was the first thing that I think is something we should probably touch on a little bit further. And I think if there's anyone out there that isn't familiar with a lot of these claims and maybe the only negative comments on services like Facebook is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, then we might have some discussion there. Another idea is just why you would want to defend Slack, right? So we have spoken a bit about why it's useful, but I think an important thing about it is there are a lot of activities that help you create Slack, but Slack also helps you create a lot of activities and it gets into this feedback loop. So for instance, we spoke about things like investing or honesty, all of those kind of things give you the ability to create Slack in the future, but Slack gives you the ability to do those things. And that feedback loop is very important. Right, Because in the same way that you can have a positive spiral, you can also have a, a negative spiral. And there have been times in my life when I have been in both sides of those spirals. And the on the way up spiral is almost as impossible to escape as the on the way down one. And you feel like it doesn't matter what you do, you can just take on things and you're in control of everything. And anything that comes up, you can pretty easily handle and take care of and deal with and succeed at. Conversely, when you're in the very negative rushing down towards the earth, like a 737 max spiral, then you are, <laughs> you, 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 it feels like there's almost nothing you can do as, as those pilots must have felt. And I think that's something to acknowledge is that you won't always be in the situation where you have the perfect positive upward spiral. And I think getting out of the negative inverse is just as important as talking about the increasing the upward spiral and really reaping the full benefits of that. So I just wanted to put those two ideas out there as, as things we can potentially come back to and discuss further. But in terms of how to create Slack in life and how to maybe use the word defend, I think defend Slack is the, is the better term because it really does feel like that. It feels like you have to 
be actively mounting a defensive operation against all these environmental factors that are trying ever so desperately to to take slack away from you yeah i mean i think this is a good point to jump in right because you recently read uh carl newport's new book digital minimalism right yeah that's right and obviously the main idea i mean you can hear it in the title there is this minimalistic maybe even ascetic approach to using technology and i'd be interested to know your thoughts on how that concept ties into this idea of slack and i'll give you my thoughts as you go yeah so i think especially in the modern world there are with services like social media but just in general the notification systems that we have and a lot of the tools that we have around us that uh, and i use tools with with inverted commas there it, it's very easy for us to saturate our time with things that have little to no value for the very reason that they make themselves seem indispensable uh, and so newport examines this in digital minimalism and he actually proposes that people first do a detox that you actually need to get some space because part of what makes these things and i'm talking almost specifically about social media here so effective at commanding your time is that when you're actively using them they have full control over the environment and they are engineering that very actively to make it very engaging, addictive, and totally under their control, which means you keep coming back and they keep owning your time. And so you need to actually break away from everything and fill your time with something else, something analog, to help you then be in a, a fair position to reevaluate what things you want to gradually reintroduce to your life. Because trying to sit back and go, okay, there's all these things in my life, now I need to take them away, is very difficult because it's, you don't know where the value is yet. You don't know what you're actually going to miss when it comes to it. And so his approach, and he actually tested this out with his mailing list. He, he had many of his readers of, of his mailing list actually actively follow their various procedures and ran a sort of informal experiment to find what was the most effective strategy for allowing people to take control of their digital lives. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably mostly familiar with the kinds of things that these social networks are doing. I mean, Everything from the fact that the notification little icon that has the the, num the numeral in it across almost every system that's red, right? Because red is the kind of color that is primarily baked into us as something that commands attention. Mm. And the UI designers have cottoned onto this. Another example is how if you open any of the timelines, which are all infinite scrolling of, of any of these services that we use for social media, the very first thing will be incredibly captivating. It will be, it, it's specifically chosen for you to be the most captivating thing. Once they've got you in, it's much harder for you to break out. The energy is now in their favor. So once they've got you in with that captivating thing, now what they do is you're playing slot machine. They start giving you stuff that you're less interested in, interspersed with things that you're interested in. And they keep it unpredictable because the beauty of the way dopamine release works in mammals is that you release more dopamine due to anticipation than you do with the actual reward. Yeah. And and so it's this idea of if you knew the coin was only always going to flip heads, it wouldn't be very fun to gamble on the coin flip because the outcome's known. And if you suspect it's almost certainly always going to go on heads, well, then that's fine. But now if it's a totally random game, it becomes that slot machine where anything can happen and the excitement is huge. And so they keep interspersing really exciting, really hot content between pretty mundane boring stuff as well as adverts and the more you use the service the more densely they pack those adverts in because they know they're not going to lose you they're bringing you back every single day multiple times a day and now you get to the point where every time you are paused for more than about three seconds be it walking into an elevator be it standing in line for something like a coffee or wherever you find yourself reaching into your pocket for this little black mirror that's going to transport you somewhere temporarily and distract you. And it's really in those moments that defending Slack can actually begin. And this is something that Newport is a, is a big advocate of, of like, leave your phone at home. Or if you very, if, if you absolutely must have your phone, you can put it in the bottom of your bag in like airplane mode, right? So the only way you can actively get it is by taking your bag off, digging through it, pulling it out, enabling 
cellular data and then you can use your phone right so and then to just uninstall all the social media on your phone right it's because there's no way your willpower will overwhelm the combined resources of some of the most powerful companies on earth employing some of the brightest minds to run these skinner box experiments on most of the world's population mm. uh, and so it, it, it can start at a very small scale but yet have huge benefits right and this is something i've done numerous times over the years is just detox from things just put hard barriers in for myself that keep me separated from all of these things and just suddenly i have like two extra hours a day in my life and it's incredible right like another great one is like if you just get a, a simple plugin for google chrome that or whatever web browser you're using firefox you can prevent youtube from being able to show you suggested videos after the end of your video right that, that means that instead of just being able to just click on the next thing you have to actively go and select a video mm. that you want to watch right now suddenly your watch time just drops to like 20 percent of what it was before yeah one that newport brings up is with netflix it's so easy to just binge things on netflix well for starters turn off autoplay if you haven't done this already come on and <laughs> A second thing you can do is by establishing very clear ground rules. Like you'll only watch series on Netflix when you're with a certain person, right? Because now you've got two people's priorities and two people's willpowers that can sort of defend. And it's, it's, it's much harder to just binge for 10 hours when there's someone else there that can feel guilty about it too mm. and, and help hold you accountable. And, and it's, it's really this. Is, these things take active thought. They take deliberate engineering. It, it's, it's lifestyle design to the next level it's lifestyle engineering now and you've got to experiment with these things try them out and and this is the situation we find ourselves in right like the default state is to just let all of this stuff flood our lives yeah and it actually takes active exertion and deliberation to fight back and that's why i think the term defending slack is important especially when it comes to these uh, digital influences in our lives there are other things that demand our slack and and consume it but i think the digital one will will give people the sort of 80 20 for, for most people for most listeners out there i'd wager that your your best bet is to focus on the 20 percent of the digital media stuff that is consuming 80 percent of your otherwise slack time then there are other things as well for me right i'm constantly finding myself in the situation that i think most internet users also do where you're basically thrust with some information that seems worth that seems at least uh worth consuming right it's interesting or it's got a nice tagline and at least i kind of habitually stack these things up you know i might see an interesting youtube series and i'll add that to watch later and i'll find an interesting article and i'll add that to the pocket app so i can read it later and i'll add a whole blog to an rss feed so i can read the whole thing later and i'll download a bunch of books i can read all of those later you get the picture here right and i mean i've often thought about this seeming trade-off between obviously finding and discovering great new content and then actually using the or let me not say use let me say actually engaging with the content that you've already discovered right and it's first of all i think as you say like really difficult to get this right and i think one way of thinking about it that helps at least is i think once you've got this idea of slack in your head right this idea that you have limited time you have limited attention you have limited resources you basically have to at some point choose what you value like what hill are you willing to die on right so maybe you know for you you're an academic uh, you do a lot of research into ai like at some level your values will be to do with learning about and researching uh, AI and machine learning, right? And so I think part of this problem of choosing what to consume is being quite specific about defining what you value and then basically asking yourself the question at every point, is this worth sacrificing Slack for? And does it converge with my values does it add value in a specific way not just in the general way of oh it was pleasant or it was you know, it you know it took my mind to that nice sort of soft cozy place where you don't have to think much now i don't know how to balance that because i think myself and many other people you often do find yourself in a situation where 
things are just difficult and you do want to switch off for a bit. Now, I think maybe the healthy way to think about that would be probably to switch off quite literally rather than switch off by turning on Netflix. So maybe there's some intuition around that. But I think this is related to another set of thoughts that I've been having uh, in the last week. I've been reading a good book called The Mind Illuminated. It's a book about meditation, but it comes from, I can't remember if he was a Buddhist monk first and then a neuroscientist or a neuroscientist and then a Buddhist monk. But or are they really the same thing? Exactly. The, the ordering may or may not matter. Uh, but anyway, it basically explores um, his understanding of the mind and how this relates to meditation. And the book does a very good job, I will say, of being very systematic about exploring how you would go about focusing and training your ability to pay attention in a very well-defined way. Let me just say that for now. And obviously, one of the hallmarks of these kinds of apps is this property where they erode our attention and they, they vie for it, right? And so it's been interesting for me this week to kind of keep these these thoughts very much, these Carl Newport thoughts of digital minimalism and combine them with the current conversation on Slack, as well as these ideas of why, just why attention and the ability to direct it to an object of your choosing might be the sort of panacea that we're all looking for, right? I mean, we've spoken on the show before of various simple things which can make any day a little bit better, right? And I've been thinking if I could even simplify that down to one particular thing, what would that be? And I think recently it's more and more this idea of if you could get, if you could train one particular ability, it would probably be the sort of two-sided coin. I do think there are two sides of the same coin here, where one is uh, what what the book would refer to as stable attention, right? And and stable attention just means the ability to direct your focus to a specific object and keep it there for the amount of time. You can keep it at the right scope, so you can see the right amount of detail. And you're not sort of mind wandering into other unrelated things, right? And then the second side of this is probably going to be misinterpreted. It goes by the name of mindfulness, which again, we've spoken about. But I think in the book, he has a very specific definition, which is worth hearing. But essentially, he sort of distinguishes between that, that focus that we spoke of already and then this idea of peripheral awareness so instead of attention it's more awareness and this is basically i think he envisions developing like a better more fine-grained peripheral awareness that can kind of discriminate between what you are allowing to percolate up into attention into that focus and so i'm almost thinking out loud now but i think a better apprehension of the mechanics of those two things, more control, so to speak. And I know control might be the wrong word in the context of meditation, but for now, bear with me. A better ability to put your attention on, on the right object at the right time, I think at least, is a good candidate for an intervention which might get you more of what you want in life and would also be a great sort of preventative measure against all the things that you don't want. Every snide comment that you regret saying, you might be able to prevent if you would only be more aware of the circumstances that lead to it and the feelings that arise when you say it, right? As one example. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I think those are very good points. There were two real key, key ideas that you brought up there that I want to circle back to. Um, but just before that, there was another another thing that you said that that caught my attention which was you were speaking about loading up your your pocket with articles to read and your watch later list on youtube with videos that you want to watch and then you hesitated over choosing a word for what it was when you came back to that content and i think there is a, a very big difference there with a lot of content we are merely consuming it but for a few things we engage with it and i think if we're honest with ourselves, we would all admit that the times we engage with content 
are much more satisfying, much more enriching and much more positive than the times we merely consume it. Now, that is not to say there is no place for mere consumption. However, I think that that consume versus engage trade-off is a really good metric to just keep track of in your own life as a heuristic for how much you are putting your Slack to good use or how you are how you're making use of your Slack. And this brings me to the the first sort of key idea that you touched on, which was really this kind of resource allocation problem, right? And, and yeah. it was, okay, well, I have the Slack now, or I'm, I'm, I would have Slack, but I'm spending it on things. And it's not, well, okay, how do I spend my time better? My time is the one finite thing in, in life that I now have to choose how I'm going to, to divvy up. And I can't get more of it. I have what I have. And how can I just spend it? best for me right and a kind of analogy that i've come up with as you were talking about this was just the idea of you can almost imagine the slack or your your, your free time as as being some kind of i don't know super niche cryptocurrency that i'm about to shill <laughs> uh, so let's call it slack coin right that's probably certainly taken and we'll we'll we'll, we'll likely get a, a cease and desist over this but <laughs> nevertheless you've got your slack coin and and you've got you've got your Slack coin to spend, and everyone gets their allocation of Slack coin, and you then have some kind of utility, some utility function because you've got goals in life, and or call it an objective function, and we'll use the standard economic phrasing of of breaking down that utility into utils, which is the currency of utility, and so really what the the challenge here is, is to spend your Slack coins in such a way that you gain the most utils. Right. And so you can gamify it in that way and look at it purely as this resource allocation game where you've got this finite resource of Slack coins. You can do certain things that allow you to sort of pull in more relative Slack coins or fewer, depending on what you what you sort of defend in your life or not. So, yeah. And then you've essentially got this this challenge of how do you spend those Slack coins to gain the most utils? So, OK, you've got three Slack coins to spend and if you spend them on social media, well, you only gain 0.1 utils. But if you spend it on reading that math textbook, you gain like five utils. And obviously you can't do that all the time because then your relaxation and you know restfulness utils start to suffer or whatever. So it is that sort of resource allocation problem. And I think that's a nice mental game to play when thinking about these things because it really encourages you to prioritize the things that you want to spend your time on and as soon as you prioritize things well then it just becomes you know like a knapsack problem right it's pretty pretty standard way to approach okay these are the things that are most important to me these are what i rank them now how do i spend some resource to gain the most total value that i can yeah Uh, and i think that's that's an actor thing that everyone has to keep doing in their lives if they want to stay ahead of this, right? And that's this lifestyle engineering that I speak of. And then the second key idea was this concept of mental slack, right? As opposed to just the raw units of time that we have All right. and the, the space to do things, right? So I, I have largely focused on time as being the key measure of slack here. And I think that's just because time is one of those things that's very fixed and it's, it's very hard to gain more time. But there are other aspects that you can have slack in. But I think mental slack is an important one that we didn't really touch on until you brought that idea up. And these are these ideas of mindfulness and being able to command one's attention. And there is definitely a difference between those days when you don't do much, but you're stuck in your head the entire time. When you manage to drive a two-hour journey without realizing you were driving at all because you're so trapped in your thoughts versus those days where you're kind of aware of every minute that goes by and you're deeply engaged in something, but consciously aware that you're engaged in it. All right. right. And those are very different days, right? You might not achieve anything outwardly quantifiable in terms of productivity metrics, but your same activities can have a very different mental slack associated with them that can make them very different experiences. Right. So standing in a line, just stressing about what's going to happen when you get to the front of the line and have to talk to that person is a very different experience from standing in line, being totally in the moment, relaxing, focusing on your posture, focusing on your breathing and valuing the fact that you're alive and that you have the, the time available to go and stand in this line to do this thing that you have to do. 
And I think that's a, a key idea that we'll, that we'll keep coming back to. And related to that was you spoke about this idea of sort of having a peripheral awareness and allowing things to percolate up into your core focus and your, your consciousness. And the analogy from sort of computer science and, and, and operating systems in particular of a scheduler versus a program or a system application really stuck out to me. And, 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 and the analogy for anyone who's not familiar is you've got the CPU, right? The, the brain of the computer that actually does the things. But you have a whole bunch of tasks that you're trying to do at the same time. And so you have this other little program called the scheduler that is in charge of deciding when you do which tasks. So they all sort of come in in a queue and it will look and go, okay, this one's that priority. This one's been waiting for this long. And it will decide based on some heuristics which ones should go next and for how long and when to switch between them. And that's what allows you to be able to move the mouse while your computer's busy doing something else. And it feels instantaneous it's because your schedule is there going, all right, this is top priority um, or use input of any kind. And, and and this idea of using this as an analogy for your acute consciousness or, or, or the things you actually want to focus your, your... So so if you were to imagine your your conscious, deliberate, focused thought mm. as your, your CPU performing some task, okay. you then have your scheduler, which is the part of you that's going to use that focus to think about what you should be thinking about next uh, at sort of at a meta level. Okay. Uh, and then you have the actual programs that you run, which are the thoughts or the thinking tasks that you actually perform, right? So for example, the scheduler would be thinking about whether you should get up and go make tea now or whether you should do one more uh, differential equation <laughs> before you take a break, okay. right? Whereas the actual programs are thinking about the differential equation or making the tea and deciding which tea you're going to have. Mm. And I, I like that analogy because once again, we can almost reduce it to a set of steps because there are known ways to schedule things. And if we can use that, that metaphor and apply those same systems, which are largely heuristic based, we can potentially find some ways to bring them into our everyday lives in a helpful and beneficial way and have some good rules of thumb or heuristics that we can apply to everyday things. So, yeah, so really it, it, was, it was those ideas of engaging versus consuming. Then that resource allocation game where you spend your Slack coins to gain utils. And then finally that idea of, of mental Slack uh, and, and the analogy of the scheduler versus the program. So I don't know if you have some, some thoughts there or where you want to explore next. Yeah, so I think when you said the idea of, of mental Slack, what I was thinking about more than the sort of resource allocation problem, as you put it, and I mean, it is related, but it's this idea that if you're constantly taking in information, right, you are consuming someone else's blog posts and you are watching a Netflix special. And then when you're not doing that, you are checking your WhatsApps. And when you are not doing that, you are scrolling through Facebook and, 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 right? I think that in that sense, that's what I what I feel when, when I start to feel like I'm losing mental slack, it's usually because I'm trying to consume several different uh, pieces or sources of information. Right. And I like the distinction that you drew right at the beginning there of this difference between consuming something, right. Where it's like, Oh, I've got five minutes to kill in this line. So let me just read an article here versus engaging. Right. Uh, and that's engaging, I would argue, you almost have to be in like a quiet place or at least in a place that you can focus. And this is something that I have been historically fairly bad at because I, I suffer from this, uh, the delusion that if you just consume more stuff, that will equal some kind of proficiency, it'll equal or translate into some sort of value, right? And actually turns out that I think in most cases, choosing rather to focus in, in the situations where the time is lost, right? You're standing in line. I think your time is best used, at least in most cases, probably practicing some control of your attention, right? But then actually in the time where you can focus, doing this real deep contemplative exploration of the material that you want to understand, right? And 
first of all, that's obviously difficult and unpleasant because now when you don't understand something, you are committing to continue thinking about it, continue searching for alternative explanations and definitions until you do. And I think like the highest sort of standard you can hold yourself to there, maybe there's two, is sort of this idea that if you can't rederive it yourself, then you don't understand it. Or almost even the measure of like the measure that you might really be sucking the marrow out of this uh, source of information is when reading just one page of it makes you want to ask so many follow-up questions that at that point you put the book down and spend the rest of, let's say you'd plan to sit there for two hours. You spend the rest of that two hours just asking and answering your own follow-up questions. And I think that level of engagement is something that I've occasionally aspired to. And then you find it how terribly difficult it is and <laughs> adjust your expectations. But I think I might be again in this place or at least in a place mentally where it seems like a project really worth trying. And so, I mean, currently I have, I'm trying to fight back against the things that are out to get me. And by this, I mean, particularly WhatsApp. So WhatsApp has been banished from my phone, at least for now. And we'll see if this can turn into a little habit here. And maybe out of this, I can also get this real application of these ideas of deep work and deep understanding to some tricky or challenging problems that are actually worth diving into and worth spending a lot of time on, regardless of what other things must be sacrificed in lieu of you know, studying those things and spending time on them. Yeah, so I, I did I did have some uh, some thoughts there on on what you were saying in terms of juxtaposing the sort of time that is roughly inconsequential when you're standing in a queue or going up in a lift or something and the time that you've set aside and devoted to actually doing some deep work and deliberate engagement with content, right? And just on that note, right, so I, I think a really good example, and this is something that Newport discusses quite a bit, is that focusing your attention on those deliberate tasks takes a little bit of time and there's an activation energy that's required before you can really settle into the task and, and get into that focused almost flow state and one thing that really helps with that is deliberately training your attention and things that very much don't help with that is every time you are slightly bored or have even a second of something not filling your attention you reach for your phone and check social media and scroll through things right and so one is actively training you to it was that's choosing to use those social media apps and distract yourself in those moments of inconsequential time is not just filling the time with sort of other meaningless crap when it would otherwise be empty. It is actively harming your practice of being able to focus your attention on something, right? So you can think of every time you are bored for two seconds and want to reach for your phone and then you choose not to and instead to just be and to just be focused in the moment you can think of every occasion like that as doing like a rep of a bicep curl let's say and you're you're, you're honing the muscle right so then when you actually need to use your biceps <laughs> to do a pull up or to to flex in the mirror you you then have all the strength there that you've trained up from doing all those curls right so this idea of that time can actually be spent well right mm. you're, you're you you can't spend it well by like sitting and doing your calculus homework because you know it's 10 seconds going up a few floors but you can spend it well in the sense that you instead of distracting yourself for that little bit of time you're actively preventing the low quality information from coming in and working on training the skill of focusing your attention which means when you do come to those two hours that you've set aside to work on the deep meaningful work it's not taking you 20 minutes to get in and you constantly have this nagging feeling of wanting to check your phone. Instead, it's like one minute and you're fully into it and you don't think about your phone the entire time. And so every time you have the opportunity to do those reps throughout the day and you actually do them, that's saving you later on 
lots of time and it's making your time that you do spend on things much more effective and if we consider the fact that this resource of time is the limiting factor in almost everything well then that I mean what what better thing could you ask for than the ability to spend it more efficiently yeah yeah that's a good point i mean it is right it is crazy the kind of contortions that you can get into when you are you know, convincing yourself that you are using your time well, but then you <laughs> you almost find that, as you say, if you were to exercise all of these um, time sinks, you suddenly find yourself with like several extra hours in a given day. And there's a lot you can do with that, right? It's it's this trade-off though, because there there are some things where it gets a little weird, right? For instance okay, you have an hour-long commute every day, well, then I'd say probably listen to a podcast or an audiobook because you're going to get a whole lot of value out of that and that's an, a decent chunk of time. Right? Trying to put your headphones in and listen to a podcast for five seconds while you're in a lift is, I mean, just ridiculous, right? Yeah. But, but doing that in a, a 30-minute to hour-long commute, that makes a lot of sense, right? You're actually putting that time to good use and if you actually have to be actively driving there's not much else you can do but listening to stuff is great and then you can you can be engaging your mind and and engaging with content but then you have these weird edge cases right so for instance i'll carry a phone with me because phones are really useful and they have a, a lot of things like navigation and the ability to carry around your payment credentials that you don't have to have a wallet and the ability to listen to audiobooks and things wherever you go but one thing that really seems to catch me is this idea of capturing ideas when i have them because we've all had those shower thoughts that we then forget about and i'm i'm very cognizant of that and i try very hard to have systems in place that let me quick capture those ideas a to get them out of my head so they're not distracting me from what i'm currently focused on but b so that i have a repository to go to next time i have that feeling of Oh, I can't think of a good idea for X. And then I just go there and there's this massive document with thousands of ideas that I've had in fleeting moments that I would have otherwise forgotten about relating to every sort of topic. So I, I have a system in place for this and it works on my phone and it requires internet access and it requires me unlocking my phone and actually doing things. And what I find is a lot of the time I'll have an idea, go to my phone to log it, do so, and then get distracted by something else. Right, So it's almost like this very positive thing has now formed this segue into these negative distracting things. And I don't know if that's that I just need to experiment more and find the sort of ideal bite point with all of this and how to lay out everything and how it all might fit together or if that's an inherent trade-off that you make. Right, So if you want to have all the flexibility of some tools, you also have to have the consequence of you need a lot more willpower and a lot more mental discipline to not use that flexibility to do crappy stuff that very big companies are trying to get you to do. I don't know if you have a similar experience. Yeah, I mean, sort of, right? I also like having my phone for podcasts and for the occasional uh, note-taking. And I've actually become much more intentional this year about how I've, I'm going to do that, right? So, I mean, the first thing I did is... For certain brands of phones, you can't uninstall like your email client, right? So what I did is I just blocked every app that I didn't want to do. So like as a rule, I do not check email on my phone. So my email app is blocked, right? Then I did some additional permissions. So now I can open WhatsApp, but I can't open it before I think 7.30 a.m. And I can only open it five times in a day. And then after that, it locks me out. And I can change that but it's more like the soft reminder. Is this why you've been somewhat unresponsive for the last week? Yeah, I've been experimenting. I've been experimenting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's my excuse, right? So wait, so what, what, what app is that or what tool have you installed to do I so think the for, for all the people out there who like the details of these things? So I think the app is called Stay Focused on Android. Uh, there's probably something okay. similar on iOS, but this worked quite well and they have you can set time restrictions and... Uh, mm. unlock restrictions and opening restrictions and everything okay. really nice yeah, so ios has actually recently built in a system to ios 12 i think that is called uh screen time and that monitors how much time you're spending on your phone doing what and allows you to impose time restrictions 
So it's not so much that only open it five times a day thing. I think that's really cool because it encourages you to be intentional about it. But there are like time limits to it, right? But but I think that the five time a day one's good because it means that you'll make those five things count. Um, whereas if it were five minutes a day, well, I can check it like a hundred times for one second and I'll still be within that, which is still bad, right? That's the problem. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah, because I've tried the time limit before uh, in various other apps and with... Anything where you can check sort of instant messaging, if you put the time limit on something like 15 minutes, you'll still be able to open that app a couple yeah. hundred times in a given day. So yeah, that, that definitely, I think, is a, a different way of thinking about it and worthwhile. I mean, it seems like WhatsApp's almost just hostile design straight up. I mean, it doesn't, you can't sign out of WhatsApp. It's inherently linked to your mobile number and, and you can't access it on the web unless your phone is also connected to mm. the internet. Which, like, it, it seems like they're using the origins of the app as a, quote, good excuse to to really have this thing that you can't easily limit or hinder or control without totally just deleting it and not using it, which would be somewhat incapacitating in at least the modern usage of the app. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that goes to the second line of defenses that I've got. So, I mean, I don't have any notifications um, the most I have is a couple of numbers can call and that goes through, but that's it. And I mean, I, I turned off notifications for WhatsApp months ago and I can, mm. I mean, sure, I'm sure a few times I needed to know something and then I had to open up my phone and then I found out, oh, the lecture is not where you thought it was. It's in a completely different venue. But I mean, is is, is knowing that worth the constant interruption of my thoughts by incessant dinging and, and those things can happen to to you if you you have the phone that's flooded with notifications as well and you just don't see it hidden in, yeah in exactly them, right? right i had a very much the same thing i think it was a little over a year ago now that i just disabled almost all notifications but specifically whatsapp on my phone and so this is also after having like no real social media apps on there and yeah i mean it was like a week where i felt kind of weird like oh shit what if someone like needs to get hold of me and then i was like, well they can just call me right <laughs> like if it's urgent or it's an emergency that's probably what they would do anyway because then there would be no latency they would either get hold of me or not and that was kind of comforting that i could just be like okay well yeah i'm not missing anything urgent and it sort of becomes a, a more asynchronous system because it feels very much like things on phones especially harkening back to the the mix it days which the south africans will will get the reference to but i mean it was a system where you had to actively be in a chat room on your phone and you yeah. had to be online to receive the messages if you went offline they didn't like cache the messages for you they just there were no messages if you were offline and whatsapp kind of like you know it was sort of there in between that phase and you know now i kind of feel like i treat my whatsapp much more like email really yeah, I mean, I don't treat it like email in the sense that I still view it as something where if I need to get hold of someone, it, like it's an instant messaging app. That that part doesn't bother me, but the intrusiveness does. So I don't know, maybe they, maybe I'm, I'm like ethically obligated. I make such a, I take such pains not to be contactable. Maybe it's a bit hypocritical then to to use it in some sense, right? To send someone a message is to yeah. impose on them. A notification which i myself would be loath to receive mm. just to finish off there on like uh, other things right so like access to uh note taking i've like vacillated between different ways of taking notes and eventually like i've always just settled on the simplest way which for me is just um a telegram chat with yourself you know you can send yourself voice notes and you can type messages to yourself and send them and then I just set up a shortcut to that chat. Uh, it sits on my home screen. And if you do all of that, you're, you can, I mean, my home screen is one page. There's no apps visible. There's just this like small black button, which takes you to the Telegram chat. So I don't know, I've, I've tried to design things so that things are not in your face. There's obviously, there's no red badges anywhere on that phone. Yeah, the whole phone is in black and white. Yeah, just disable the freaking badges. If there's one yeah, thing you can do. Oh, have you gone for the black and white thing as well? Uh, I did it. I mean, I, I think full grayscale would have been annoying. So I just changed the background and then changed all the icons. 
that yes, I spent several hours doing this. That, yes, that's wow. just. I mean, these are the kind of unnecessary features that Android has that are really great for people who are engineering their phone to be distractionless, <laughs> but who no one else ever needs. Yeah, no, it it was maybe a little bit excessive, but hey, uh, it means that I've got one screen where I don't have to see any apps. But if I need an app, I can tap a button and open a hidden folder and then find the app. And that works for me, you know. Excessive, yes. Worth it, maybe. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> like some things are just, just fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a phase a few years ago where I was just trying all these different approaches to seeing how I could, um, well, a little bit of context first. So I was part of the... Uh, wine tasting society at university i was on like the the committee that that was managing the society and part of my job was to manage the social media presence Oy, and so yeah. i had the facebook account but the only way that you can connect a, a company facebook account is to link it to your personal facebook profile right like the bastards um <laughs> and so i had to find a way that i could do productive actual work on this without constantly being distracted by my own personal facebook that at that point i was trying to just avoid entirely so i was exploring various different like uh, browser plugins because it's all on on desktop i didn't have the app uh browser plugins to make make the timeline disappear and like hide all the notification badges and various different things like this um i think one of the most entertaining was called i'm actually going to look it up quickly because it is it is totally worth it I, i think it's called stay focused um stay focused i don't have it in my extension but without the e in the focused so focused uh yes i think that's right yeah that's a good desktop app a chromium based extension and yeah and 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 so this was um it's cool in that you can blacklist or whitelist certain websites uh, and you can allocate certain quantities of time to certain websites so i would say have 30 minutes a day that i could spend on useless crap like facebook or instagram or at that point, YouTube as well, because I wasn't really watching anything meaningful at the time. And if you want to then like disable the app or any of the settings once you've initially set them, you can, but you have to type out this really long paragraph transcribing it from the text above and you can't make any mistakes. Like you can't like just hit backspace if you make a mistake, it'll cancel the whole thing. You have to get it perfectly keystroke for keystroke correct. And it's painstaking. It takes something like a solid five minutes of, deliberate focused effort typing at granny speed with like hunt and peck to make sure you hit the right key so it's an incredibly effective way to stop you from just extending your time by another 10 minutes because Mm. you're busy like watching something or looking at an interesting meme because there's so much activation energy that is required to actually go and do that task that that makes the option of just quitting the social media thing that you were looking at the much easier option right so if you focus on this whole path of least resistance thing if you put the right tools in place you can engineer that path of least resistance to not be mindlessly scrolling through whatever social media app and to actually be directing you towards more meaningful things yeah nice shall we leave it there yeah i think we've had a a pretty good uh, chat we've touched on like digital minimalism we've touched on engaging with content versus consuming it the general ideas behind Slack and all the different forms it might take and how that forms a, a feedback loop with other aspects of life, such that if you have more Slack in your life, it offers you more opportunities and more freedoms, which then in turn allow you to gain more Slack in your life. We talk about the the mental Slack um, and mindfulness and just free of mental clutter and how that can enhance your experience when it does come to doing deep, meaningful work. And then a few practical things about how we actually set up things in our lives and engineer our our digital worlds to afford us a little little more slack on a daily basis. But yeah, it was a good chat. Good. Do you want to end off uh, maybe saying what the best podcast you listened to in the last week or so was? Um, I will just go with a general recommendation of something. But if you have one, go first. Um, Yeah, I have been enjoying... I thought there was a great episode of patrick o'shaughnessy's show it's called invest like the best uh this one was not related to investing at all it was with a guy named david epstein and it was on this idea of early specialization versus this feeling i think that 
people in our generation will suffer from more and more, which is I'm getting behind in my career. And basically the podcast sums up some of the research on this and debunks some of the thinking around the 10,000 hour rule, debunks some of the thinking around just this necessity for insane levels of dedicated practice to one sworn interest at a very young age and i think it was sort of a restoring thing on just the humanity of not knowing what you're going to do acknowledging that uncertainty and being able to sort of confidently explore this landscape and find what really interests you and it just was uh it was pleasant to, to listen to them speak about that and uh certainly heartening to anyone who is in that position of not knowing exactly where they're going and maybe wondering if they're making a mistake by even allowing themselves the luxury of wondering. Awesome. Very nice. Definitely worth checking out. Um, I've got something a bit different for, for this week. It's a podcast called Good One, a podcast about jokes. <laughs> and it generally focuses on interviewing different comedians uh, of various kinds or, or comedic writers. And they have some really good stuff out there. But one in particular that I listened to recently was uh, entitled... Kevin Hart's kids walk in on him having sex and it is an interview with Kevin Hart in his trailer for like where he's busy filming his his latest movie and it's talking about his most recent Netflix comedy special and on the stand-up routine that he does there and it it goes pretty into the weeds with his process which I found really fascinating as a person who's tried to write humorous things in the past and and how you have to really workshop jokes because it's sometimes funny in your head and not funny on paper. It's sometimes funny on paper and not funny out loud. And some things just work universally and some things just really don't. And seeing that process and how it's m much of an interplay between him and his close group of friends and associates that allows him to refine his jokes was really interesting. Uh, hearing some of his thoughts on the world around high performing stand up comedians and the reason why a lot of people kind of have two or three like they have one massive breakout special then they have a really big special that they do and then the third one people start turning against them and then the fourth one is normally a complete like load of garbage and then they fade into relative obscurity and how for him it's been a challenge to keep reinventing himself every time and how he has to almost like rethink his identity every time he wants to do a new stand-up special. And I thought that it was a really interesting approach to a lot of poignant social and intellectual questions from a very different perspective. And of course, it's very entertaining to listen to because Kevin Hart is a very amusing guy. And the podcast naturally has that, that tendency to make jokes and to be lighthearted. But it gets really deep and it gets really interesting in a number of different dimensions so for something a little bit different that's a good one a podcast about jokes all right well uh as always thank you that's a good one yeah until next time thanks for listening to the bit of a tangent podcast if you enjoyed this episode please get in touch with us and share your thoughts you can email us at podtangent at gmail.com that's p-o-d tangent at gmail.com or connect with us on Twitter through the handle at PodTangent. For more information about us, our backgrounds, and other projects we're involved in, visit our website at PodTangent.com. The best ways to support us are to share one of our episodes with someone who might enjoy them or give us a rating and review on iTunes. That way, Apple knows that we're actually worth listening to and all the platforms that pull content from them will know this as well. Jean-Luc and I both love having these discussions and we relish the opportunity to share ideas with like-minded people around the world. Your support and listenership are sincerely appreciated. Until next time.